All right, let's kick that off. So this, as you, I'm sure, are all aware, is the final um, lot of lectures. I will do it in two halves. The first one's going to be trustee liability. Um, and the second, we'll talk about beneficiary rights. But essentially, you're coming to the end of the content of the subject. And so really, we're just going to be hitting the exam stuff from this point forward. So I'll bring this up on the screen, hopefully, in a second. And we'll go and talk about what this is about. Now, I have made a point with this particular subject that particularly the last three lectures, so this week and the previous two, a lot of the things overlap. When we talk about trustee duties, when we talk about trustee rights and trustee, trustee liabilities, there's going to be this overlap between these things. Um, it's just the nature of this content that it doesn't easily separate itself out into distinct packets and chunks of things to learn, um, which is a tad unfortunate. And certainly, as you're aware, the way that you're examined on this in the final exam is very much um, a case of demonstrate your knowledge in entirety by picking out little snippets of information from the exam. Um, question, long scenario, and discussing them rather than giving substantive advice on a particular area. Um, it's a little bit unusual uh, in that, and it means that it can be a bit discursive. So I'm, while I'm trying to create these unified themes of and trying to categorize things in areas, in reality they overlap a lot. And so the material from here, for example, we've talked about some parts of it before. Because this is what happens when there is some sort of breach or some sort of loss in relation, relation to what a trustee does. What are they going to have to do and what are the mechanics they use for, um, uh, for working this stuff out? So the starting point is, um, that, and this is from Reed Dawson, that the, the whole point of making trustees liable, uh, there's sort of this overarching theme, is to put the trust fund back as much as it can to where it would have been if the breach hadn't occurred. Now, if we stop and think about that, and we think about our knowledge of tort, particularly tort of negligence, and contract, we know that in tort, the purpose of damage awards is as far as money can to put a person in the situation sure he would have been in if the tortious action had never happened. All right, you can't unbreak someone's leg, but you can compensate them with money. We know it's about trying as much as you can to really get them back to where they were. Sure, there'll be um, interest and damage awards and, and such like, with loss of income, we have to extrapolate that out of the future periods. But essentially in tort, that's what we're trying to do, get things back to where they were. Uh, March and Stromare, for example. Now, you hopefully also remember the rule in contract law, which is different. Contract law is not about putting you back to where you were. The principle in Robinson and Harmon is all about putting you in the position you would have been in if the other side did what they promised. That's a fundamental rule in contract law. I'm really hoping that this isn't news to you guys now. It's a really important rule. And that is the difference between the, the way compensation works in tort and in contract. Now, very unfortunately, maybe not from my perspective, because it means I have a job, equity, and particularly the restoring of trust properly, property to the trust, has a slightly different rule again. Um, and that's because trust property, remember, is supposed to be invested. And so the starting point in equity is to go back and try and restore the trust property or really the beneficial interests in the trust property to where it would have been if the breach didn't happen. Which, again, if you actually think about it, is logically slightly different to tort into contract as well. And so th th as a result, 
we know that equity is fluid in how it goes about awarding um, dollar awards to people and the way it can go through and do compound interest. And there's a variety of alternate um, remedies that you can only seek in equity. Specific performance, injunction, the various types of constructive trusts and, and purchase monies trusts. So that we know that equity has that flexibility. What we need to note, and again, I, I would say that you'd be probably repeating this, if not those exact words, but something similar to that in your exam, because this is the starting point thing, um, remedies to the innocent party. Okay. So would, it's, I think it's helpful to think of this in terms of the analogy between tort, contract, and equity, or at least um, in terms of breach, trustee breaches is what we're, the thing we're looking at here, to just be able to see the themes. You guys, most of you are in your final semester of law, and as such, I think it's a really worthwhile time to sort of reflect on that, to see the same themes being repeated throughout different areas of the law. Sure, they have different tests. Sure, they have different cases and different statutory rules. But the themes are very much similar. We're trying to compensate here, but where we're trying to get to is different from those other two areas of law. We're not trying to undo the civil wrong. We're not trying to uphold the bargain. We're looking out for the economic interests of the beneficiaries. And you'll also recall, hopefully, from your time doing tort and doing contract, that one of the key things that you need to do in those areas is prove, as the plaintiff, that the particular breach caused your loss. And you may recall that some forms of tort, um, trespass for example, um, some things have different or strict tests, but if we think about, when I'm referring to tort here, I'm really thinking of the tort of negligence. Negligence has a variety of tests for causation. Do you, I'm not sure if you guys will recall um, you know, material and substantial contribution, a common sense test, a but-for test. Um, uh, there's a, another one too, I can't quite recall, natural consequence test or something similar. In contract law, there's only one test. It's the, it is the but-for test, tempered by a common sense proviso. Right. In equity, though, the test for causation is much, much, much stricter. And the reason for that is that unlike these other two areas of law, we hold the person under the duty to a very, very high standard. If trustees breach these duties, we want as much as we can to use the law to make them accountable. And as such, the test for causation really only requires there to be some logical connection between the loss and the particular breach. So the test for causation is much stricter than those other two areas of law. Um, in fact, I should probably also add um, the criminal law has tests for causation as well. Those that are either studying crim now, most of you would have done it in the past. But it has these same tests. And you might also recall, as well as this causation aspect, did X cause Y? You can have chains of events. Does A cause B? Maybe. Does B cause C? Maybe. Does C cause D? Maybe. Does D cause E? This chain of events this might sound familiar to you guys because that's the test for remoteness. How far removed a particular loss is from the particular event that we're going to hold the person liable for. In tort, we know that that's to do with the breach. The remoteness has to be calculated from the breach and it's to do with foreseeability. Was it reasonably foreseeable that a particular packet of harm would occur at the end of this chain of events. In contract law, that test for remoteness involves contemplation. What could the parties have talked about? Either something at the time that they entered into this bargain, is it to do with naturally occurring consequences, or might they have actually talked about something? 
That's the, uh, the limbs of Headley and Baxendale. In equity, we don't care about remoteness. If you can prove a logical connection, that's all you need to do. So strictly speaking, breach of trust doesn't have a test for remoteness. Uh, a comparable situation might be, and again, this is maybe stretching your memories a bit, the tort of deceit. I don't know if you remember the tort of deceit. You may or may not have studied that when you learned about misrepresentation and the three different types of misrepresentation in contract law when you talk about innocent, negligent, and fraudulent. If you're fraudulently doing something, there's no test for remoteness. You can't put your hands up in the air and say, oh, I couldn't have, this time when I lied to you, I couldn't have foreseen this particular loss or I couldn't have contemplated this particular harm. It doesn't matter. You're going to be liable for that. And that's the standard that we hold trustees accountable for here. We also, as part of the fact that we're not having a test for remoteness, we can't really use the novice actus intervenes rule. Uh, that is the idea at law that where there is a chain of events that happens, if an, an intervening event came in and broke that chain and taught and a contract, the um, defendant won't be held liable. Again, we're not concerned about that in equity. We actually want to terrify and tyrannize trustees into the highest standards of behavior. The duty we impose on fiduciaries is high. And again, these are the sorts of points that you might want to make when you're talking about particular packets of loss in your exam for the subject. Okay. Now, again, this is a recap from slides from a few weeks ago when I talked about interest rates. Because when you're trying to determine what the quantum of dollars that needs to be uh, made, the order that needs to be made, the courts do go through and calculate that. And they do make this distinction between essentially negligent and innocent breaches of fiduciary duty and fraudulent ones. If you're dishonest in your breach, if you take the client's money and misuse it, that's going to incur a higher than market rate. And that's part of this idea that there's an aspect of, of punishment here as well. Although you might find that courts don't like using that phrase. Some judges don't like using the term punishment because that really falls outside the scope of what equity is trying to achieve. Shield, not a sword and all that. Nonetheless, as a rule, the courts will charge a higher rate of interest. They call it the compound rate. Although, um, certainly, um, Tom would, would say it somewhat tongue-in-cheek, judges aren't particularly good with numbers. And so when we th talk about compound rate and compound interest, uh, it's difficult to um, sometimes to see the, the very mathematical connection between these things, a compound interest rate leading to a particular result. Say, for example, if a breach occurred a really long time ago, you know, 20 years ago, the compound interest, if you'd put that equivalent amount of money in the bank, would, could be quite large. But you're dealing with hypotheticals. And so while we use the term compound rate um, to describe that, uh, again, famous holdings in Kane High, it's not, strictly speaking, a mathematical formula. Yes, there is to be compound interest. Yes, investments would have some form of return. And in accord with that last line there as well, we need to take into account what the trust fund would have made. And that's a hard thing to do because our crystal balls are limited. But the courts are much more readily willing to impose 
are essentially punitive rates of compound interest to dishonest breaches, much more than they are for innocent and negligent ones. And so that, that aspect of trying to calculate what the fund would have made is an aspect of persuasion. There's a reason why barristers love this area of law because your skill as an advocate probably make a difference. I'm trying to calculate the quantum and at the end of the day, that's what your client is after. What was the position that this fund would have been in if that breach never happened? Okay, and so the, that aspect of quantum and quantifying the amount of loss, uh, is it, it, it's hard to do and you won't be expected to, to really to calculate that, not in terms of assessment here. It's, it's not relevant in terms of what the courts might or might not do or say. You do just need to know the rules, that idea that a negligent breach is not going to impose the same amount of interest, compounded interest, that a fraudulent breach will give. Um, but that last point is pertinent. It's the trustee. We start by taking action against the trustee who's done the breach. That's the starting point in terms of recovery. Right, I'm going to just change tack a, a little bit here. Um, I said I've tr generally tried to find, follow the order that Tom had for these. Um, but leaving aside the quantum aspect and thinking more about other aspects of liability, if you are a trustee, unlike an executor, you are a trustee only while there is trust property. Okay, we learned that from our class tests. Once there's no trust property, there's no trust. And we also know that trustees can retire. Trustees that are um, you're usually in um, express trust, trustees are appointed uh, voluntarily. They will operate ex gratia. And from time to time, they may just put their hands up in there and say, I don't want to do this anymore. And there's that statutory mechanism for them to retire. Um, it can be done with a replacement just under the Act, to Section 12. Um, if there's a situation where, uh, particularly where there's one trustee and they don't want to do it anymore, the court must get involved in that situation. Okay, and the, your liability ceases when you retire. All right, now, when I say your liability ceases, your liability ceases for breaches that occur after that time. In other words, for things that you're not responsible for. If the breach occurred before that time, then you can still be held liable, even though you're not formally a trustee anymore. That aspect of liability doesn't go away. Again, I'll, I think at the end of this lecture, I'll talk about the limitation of action. Um, and how that operates in regards to trust. It's a little bit more complex than other areas of law. But uh, if you have a breach before you retire, then you retire, you're still going to be held accountable for that. Death. Usually death gets you out of a variety of things. In this situation though, when you do die, things that have been incurred, breaches that you've made, amounts that you've withdrawn from the trust um, property, will basically just be subject to the same rules. The executor essentially is standing in your shoes. They'll be subject to the same rules of liability in regards to that. Um, and so that, that if you do die and you have some form of estate, you will be liable, well, your executor will be liable to take funds from that estate and pay them out. The executor can also make a claim under Section 72 so that if you have a right to reimbursement, 
either under the instrument or the mechanical aspect of law for outlays honestly and reasonably made. And you can, uh, the executor can step in your shoes and claim that from the trust fund. Um, bankruptcy is a little bit trickier. When you become bankrupt, uh, you guys may uh, recall us, again, I think we might have, have talked about this idea that you can be a bankrupt and a trustee. It perhaps is not a good look. I mean, if you can't manage your own affairs, why would you be trusted to look after um, you know, the interests, the legal interests of trust property for the benefit of um, beneficiaries? But nonetheless, you can still do it. Um, you can be removed, but only by the court, unless the instrument specifically allows it. In other words, the list of things that allow substitution in section 12, uh, deeds can be, um, deeds or wills, can actually enshrine and often do a rule to be able to let either all the other trustees or the nominated person remove a bankrupt and replace them with someone else. Because the, as well as the fact that it's not a good look, a bankrupt has already demonstrated a lack of um, ability to control their finances. The other thing to note is the, the mechanics in section 153 of the Bankruptcy Act. Because by default, when you become bankrupt, you're released from all forms of debt. And that makes sense. The whole point of bankruptcy is to wipe the slate clean, start again. However, there is, a, I think in many ways, a slightly quirky exception to that, which is in 153 sub 2 sub B, that if you're a bankrupt, if you're a trustee, and you commit fraudulent breaches, not negligent, fraudulent breaches of fiduciary duty, after you have been discharged, usually three years, you are still liable for those debts. So this idea of having um, bankruptcy as a mechanism to avoid fraudulent breaches of fiduciary duty won't fly. It's one of the few things that even after you've been through the period of bankruptcy, beneficiaries can still seek compensation from you for fraudulent breaches only. Not negligent, just fraudulent ones. And it's something of a, um, I think it's something of a, a sort of quirky exception, but you can kind of see the, the intent of that particular rule Now, uh, either last week or the week before, I talked about the, um, the right to contribution. This idea that where there's a breach, all of the trustees are going to be held liable, in equity anyway. Why? Because the breach of fiduciary duty grants the person a right to sue. Um, and they get to sue the trustees um, jointly and severally. Now, there is statutory modification to that. Sort of like the, here's the rule, and here's the bit that's an exception to that rule. And unfortunately, it's one of those rules which is different in Queensland from other jurisdictions. Um, so, and I'll, I'll preface that, the South Australian one is, has some parts which are similar, um, but other parts that make it different again. But note that in the other jurisdictions, um, they do say, again, in their equivalent of our Trust Act, that in a situation where one or more trustees is responsible for the breach, statutory rule says the other ones, the innocent ones, won't be. 
Okay. Unless it, the loss occurs through willful negligence or default. Um, I'm sure that those that have been around law school for long enough would appreciate that the word willful and the word negligence sit very uncomfortably next to each other in a sentence. Because negligence by definition is strict liability. And so in Queensland, they don't use that phrase. It, they, the phrase that they use in section 71, which I think is on the next slide, is where the loss occurs through their own default. So the starting position is, the statute says, only the trustees that are responsible for the particular loss will be held accountable unless the other trustees have in some way through their own default caused or contributed to that loss. So what that means is that in theory, trustees in Queensland are held to a higher standard. Or rather, they can't as easily use the excuse. Because the definition of own default is broader in application than willful negligence or default. That's the implied indemnity section at section 71 of the Trust Act. So that phrase towards the end, oh, really, that's the last three words. Trust, the trustee's own default. It's not the same as it is in the other jurisdictions. And arguably, it means that trustees in Queensland are more likely to be caught. Essentially, you as a trustee, in going away, not managing, not checking, not verifying or auditing what the other trustees are doing, are more likely to be held liable alongside them. In other words, less likely to be able to use the excuse in section 71, the statutory defense. And like a lot of sections in the Trust Act, there's a wall of text there, because it essentially is enshrined in the common law. So there are some other defence sections. Again, several of them we've already looked at. Um, section 54 is where you, in good faith, without negligence, appoint an agent. Agents that are appointed under Section 54 must be registered with the relevant body. And there's a reason for that. If you are a registered auditor, a registered accountant, a registered actuary, registered or valuer, um, registered solicitor. All of those professions have one defining characteristics that is an insurance fund. And so that it is prudent for trustees to pay more money, more trust funds, in order to secure agents that have this insurance component. Similarly, tradespeople, registered builders, registered electricians, and so on. That is just part and parcel of being a trustee. So that um, perhaps this is uh, unkind because there's a generational thing here. But when I was a lad, 
the cash economy was much more of a thing. Whereas uh, last night I had to go somewhere and had to bring cash for somebody. And it was just this arduous, difficult task having to stop, find a money machine, get cash out, because we're just not used to doing that. And so this idea of doing things and paying cash, not paying tax, not paying GST, those things, hopefully, in this day and age, are becoming less and less. So just make note, when you are acting as a trustee, you'd be absolutely crazy to get somebody to do a cash job on trust property. Because you, again, you're held to a very high standard. Okay, um, I think I talked about Reese Stewart last time. This is to do with loans and investments and the fact that they didn't go through, check the loans, um, get them independently valued, check to see whether the credit rating of the particular person they were lending money to, um, go through and review the loans to see whether they were paying regularly, to see whether or not they, um, the uh, repayment capability of the various persons was still uh, up to an appropriate standard. They breached a variety of ways. So Reece Stewart is, uh, that, um, is essentially the situation where they said, look, in situations where a trustee has done all of the diligent steps that were needed, carefully gone through, checked things, the court can forgive breaches made as a result. So breaches that are made honestly and reasonably, the courts can forgive. But you have to apply to it. It's not available by right. The courts may forgive such breaches. Um, another area where you can um, absolve yourself as responsibility as a trustee is by asking the beneficiaries. Oh, hey, I've committed a breach. I'm putting all my cards on the table. Will you bear this loss? Because if you think about it, if you're a trustee, you've made a breach and you've lost money in some way. The beneficiaries are the ones that are essentially going to suffer if that breach is written off. So if they go through and essentially indemnify the trustee and say, we will bear the loss instead of you, then that's fine. It can also happen through acquiescence. In equity, we use the term latches, which you're, I'm sure you've encountered in, in a prior, uh, previous to this, um, or in Ford, a uh, high court case, they talk about that. If you, as the beneficiary, become aware of a particular breach and just don't care, and you let it sit for a long period of time, the courts will say that you've essentially assented to this. You've acquiesced on your rights. Equity, remember, assists the diligent, not the tardy. If you find out about a breach and wait five years before seeking some sort of remedy, the courts may, again, all of these things are discretionary, may say that you're right. Um, essentially, that your acquiescence has led to you releasing the trustee from that liability. Um, Another defense there is the, uh, is the statutory right to ask the court things. You're always, as a trustee, able to go to the court, put all your cards on the table, and say, look, Your Honor, we don't know what to do now. And if the court says, okay, you need to do A, B, and C, if you then go away and do A, B, and C, you won't be held liable as a result. Following the directions of the court, won't render you liable. Beneficiaries can't seek to recover from loss that's incurred by trustees, again, honestly and reasonably following the um, directions of the court. 
Okay. Now, you most of you would be aware of Section 10 of the Limitations of Actions Act. You would have come up with this probably multiple times. That idea that actions in tort, quasi-contract contract are limited to six years, personal injury to three, I think, defamation for one. None of that applies for... for um, for breaches of fiduciary duty and to uh, uh, to recover trust property, um, because the different types of breaches have different types of limitations. So a fraudulent breach does not have a limit, a time limit to bring an action. Now, how does that sit with the previous slide? Well awkwardly. The idea that equity still won't assist a volunteer and equity still um, uh, assist the diligent, not the tardy. But the rule of latches in equity is, is discretionary in how it's applied. All the statute is saying is that, look, you can apply, you're not barred from applying for a fraudulent breach. You can do it at any period you like. Not that you're going to get granted the remedy, but you, you're not statute barred from it. Whereas for other actions, so for negligent breaches, it's six years. And it's six years from the date, to, again, this language is similar to section 10, to where the right of action uh, accrues. Now, this is complicated by the way that life tenancies and remaindermen work, which is uh, that 27, two capital A, um, because if you think about it, if you're a life, uh, if you're a remainderman, your interests, in other words, your rights to receive stuff, doesn't start until the life tenancy ends. And so, if that's a life of a natural person, that could be a very long time. And so, Parliament has intervened and must have intervened later, so 1970, oh, it says 1973, wrong year on the on the Act. Good work, Simon. Um, but essentially, you can't bring an action until that particular uh, life tenancy has ended. And thus, um, your six years doesn't start till then either. And so as such, that can take a very long time. And operates as an exception to sort of the... Um, the general rules and principles in section 10. Okay, um, so just to note in regards to this, um, to this component of the lecture, uh, that there are lots of small rules, each of which you're probably going to have to tuck away. Because when you're going through and doing and answering your exam questions, each of those little small rules, particularly to do with quantum, um, and to do with ways that trustees can escape liability, they are going to arise in most of the factual situations. So you may even find that there, is, there may be a bit of duplication of those, which is you know, maybe good for you guys in terms of grades. Um, but it also means that you've got a bunch of rules you've got to now learn. Okay, so I'm going to I'll leave that recording there. Um, take five minutes, I think. Five, you know, just get some water. And I'll come back and do the final session. Thanks.